This is City Sides Podcast, and I'm Larry Kutzler. Today we have an entrepreneur, a teacher, an influencer of leaders with us today as we talk to him about his vision and his ministry, his business, as he reaches out to the church and to business with the principles of leadership that he has discovered over the years. David McKnight is the founder of McKnight Leadership Academy, and David is with us today. David McKnight, you're one of the founders or the founder of McKnight Leadership Academy. Tell us a little bit about that particular group. What is it? What is it all about? Well, the McKnight Leadership Academy came about as a result of my work with leaders in the for-profit and nonprofit world, seeing them leading in many different ways that were not authentic to who they were. I believe that everyone has an internal job description in which they lead from. So much of our work in leadership today is is knowledge and it's looking at external things. And I sat in a room one day, uh, about 20 leaders and are on a big conference table, and it just jolted me when I realized there was a lack of leadership in the room, yet everyone there had a title that would lead you to believe they were a leader. And so I said, what would it be like to have an organization that could go into a organization and help them lead from the context in which they're in, as opposed to sending them to someplace outside of their context to learn how to lead? So that's where it came from. So we want to talk about the mechanics of that, David, in this uh, podcast. But when you say you sat in this table and you had all these uh, people around the table with titles, but you yeah. realized there was no leadership, was... what were you seeing that was lacking? I mean, how did you decide? describe yeah. the lack of leadership. It was it was well scary and I realized I had a lot to learn but uh, what I saw is uh, a lot of posturing I suppose is a one word for it leading out of a an, not an authentic self but they weren't who they were and it was just obvious. The work that I had been doing with leaders was trying to help them understand there's a way you lead best and it's from how you it's from your structure of interpretation. But I saw these leaders leading from outside of that, and it was just almost painfully obvious. Leaders uh, that I work with today, they're very comfortable when they've got a position or a platform to stand on. You take them off that platform, and they're lost. So maybe around this table, these were a group of leaders who were not on their platform within the context of how they are viewed as leaders. And kind of everything was kind of falling flat, and I thought, we're in trouble. <laughs> I can imagine what that felt like. I know as a former pastor, uh, I went to seminary and I was kind of trained in a certain mindset of leadership. So when the pastor in me came on the scene, I had to be that pastoral role. I mm -hmm. had to be the peacemaker. I had to make sure everyone was happy, everyone was content. And that wasn't me. That wasn't me naturally. Mm -hmm. So do these people just live out a certain paradigm they have that either their business school or their, their church? church or their seminary train them to be, but they, what you're saying, that's not who they really are. Schools give you information and knowledge, and you have work experience, and that's what I call the things above the waterline. What's below the waterline is what's really important, and that, in, in essence, is how, how we're made. We're given a set of abilities that we go to. They're ours. We use them no matter what situation we're in. And if we're not cognizant of that, that's where people get into trouble. We talk about our strength is also our weakness. So a person gets compulsive about that which they do best. And generally I would find that when a leader is getting backed into a corner or they're running into difficulties, what do you reach in to do? You don't do what you do worst, what you're not very good at. You do what you do best and you do more of it. Well, if what you've been doing hasn't been helping, doing more of it only exacerbates the situation. And so if leaders aren't truly aware of, in essence, what's below the waterline in their life, of who they are, they're going to get off track pretty quickly. So when we take a leader, for example, who comes to you and says, you know, David, I've got this education, I've got this motivational training behind me, but you know it's not working today. What do you do with that leader? How do, you, how do you get to the assessment of who they are? Well, it's important to understand who they are. And the other part that rarely gets talked about is the context in which they're in. So a leader is in one organization and they move to another. They're bringing their stuff to that new organization, but they're now in a new context. And so our leader, I think, has to ask two questions. What's really going on here, and what do I need to do about it? So they need to understand context. Context is a big component of what uh, that dictates the kind of results you're going to get in an organization. That's why a leader, if they're not aware of that, and not aware of who they are, 
in essence, a sense of self-awareness, they aren't going to be able to, in essence, take responsibility for what they have, nor if they're aware of the context in which they're in. They might assume, well, I'll bring my good stuff to the table and it'll work again. All of a sudden, we have a much different context and they find that it doesn't work. Organizations, when they hire a leader, if they're not aware of that, will wonder, why isn't this working out here? One, because they haven't really thought through what the issues around that role were and what the requirements were to that to those issues, and then what were the actual abilities you needed to have alive in that leader to make the difference, to solve the problem, to get the results, to move the organization forward. That's a great description. In fact, David, as a former pastor, I'm going to go back to my own experience. Sure. I went to Bible school and seminary to learn theology. I wanted to be a leader, a shepherd that led people theologically to think through what the what the scriptures taught, what a believer should act like, and so forth. But I found that in the church, they were looking for a Lee Iacocca. They were looking for somebody who had the CEO and marketing experience that, you know, I never had. And I wonder if that isn't some of the tension today in a lot of churches. Uh, people are hired because they have a, a degree from a seminary, but the leaders of the church want something more than that. Is that what you're finding? Uh, well, I would say... Yes. Most organizations, most I say, because I have sat in some church boards where they don't want to grow. We like right where we are. But most organizations are looking to grow, to be healthy, to expand, to get, to bring more people in. Well, there are three components here. You bring a leader in, that leader is going to create change, and change is going to result in conflict. And if the leader isn't aware of those pieces and isn't ready to embrace them, they run into problems. Churches or an organization of any kind, nonprofit, for-profit, need to understand what it is, where they want to go. What are the real issues that they're involved with? Case in point, I did a, a helped a church of about 8,000 members uh, find a new senior pastor. They had had a founding pastor, had been there 20 years. Now they needed an, the next pastor to come in. And we went through very clearly thinking around what were the issues that they now faced going forward. Those issues as a whole brought together issues around this particular person's job, and there were requirements to that. So we set out the abilities to make that happen. Now this person then was hired. They had like two and a half pastors for an 8,000 member church. Six months later, he asked me to come back and say, tell them again what my abilities are and what they asked me to do. And we had five things on the list. Out of all the number of things, you mentioned you had issues that you can handle. Well, most pastors are asked to do 25 things, five of which they can do well. Well, we picked the top five and said, only do these things. He stuck to those things, and within a year, they were up 400 giving units or 400 families to join the church after a result of one year because he stuck to what he was good at. He said, I could have done a lot of things under the umbrella of shepherd, of pastor, but not, but I did what the church had asked me to do because the church was real clear about that. Most organizations aren't that clear. They uh, get a job description together and then look for resumes. So in that example, David, because there were other aspects what the church also needed, he did five of the best. Did they hire other staff to do the other 20? Well, eventually they uh, had a pretty good volunteer organization and over time began to fill in the gaps. But those first few years, they really maintained clarity and boundaries around his time and what he was good at and why he was hired. And it's interesting, that search committee that started stayed together for 12 years, and every year they celebrated his coming and brought clarity again why he was here, what he was called to do, and as a result, his vision, and he got to do more and more of what he was good at. Your ministry here, or your business in the McKnight Leadership Academy really does help churches and organizations get to that point. So I'm going to ask another question that's directly to churches today, because I'm interested in leadership from that perspective. Sure. In your estimation, based upon your interaction with the churches today, how are leaders doing on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being the best. I don't think we have too many 10s, more in the 2 to 3 to 4, because I think change is happening on such a rapid pace, and the church hasn't really embraced that. Leadership or pastors who are in a situation, it's easier to, to leave and go somewhere else than to try to change this organization, or I'm not going to venture out and risk uh, anymore. I'm not going to get the limb cut off from behind me. So they kind of live in a toxic soup. And then that whole structure dictates results. And if 
one person uh, rarely can change a structure. It takes a team. It takes an effort. It takes the enough people to realize we got to do things differently. Or we have to change our behavior in order to get different results than we're getting. So sometimes, David, it's almost like a sports team. The team isn't winning, so get rid of the coach. Yeah. Yet it's probably a whole systematic issue that has to change, right? For a church, I would say yes. In in part because it's, a, it's in essence, it's a volunteer organization, which makes it much more difficult. A pastor doesn't have the ability to let you go if you don't do your job, so to speak. I would say a pastor's job is one of the most difficult jobs we have out there today. One, because they're expected to do so many things. Churches are either in a holding pattern or hanging on, or they want to do risky things. And it takes a special person, uh, a leader. The very concept of a leader constitutes there's going to be change happening. And if churches aren't aware that are change adverse, they're going to have problems. The problem is change isn't going to stop. It's outside of us, outside of the walls of the church. It's changing rapidly. So churches need to get clear about what it is that's not going to change and be willing to let go of those things that are impeding their growth. You know, David, I know of a couple of churches, a medium to large size churches that decided, well, we need to hire a younger pastor, senior pastor, went ahead and, and did so, uh, early 30s, mid 30s type senior pastor. And uh, he made some changes that really kind of drove everybody over 40 out the door. So that's a kind of thing that even though congregation think this is what we need for the next generation, it may not be the best for the overall church structure. Hiring a pastor of a church today is a much more difficult task than it was 20 years ago. And churches generally are, are, not in the, are not experienced in hiring a pastor because they haven't done it for a while. And I would really encourage those churches that are in that situation to really consider outside help, out, someone to give them an outside perspective on the situation, whether it's denominational or, or someone who has some expertise to help them think through the process. Well, just like the McKnight Leadership Academy, right? <laughs> We could do that, yes. (laughs) Well, I think that's important because resources are very essential in this type of uh, dilemma that a lot of churches uh, go through. Now, David, because you've been through this many, many times with many churches, what's the average time between the resignation of a senior pastor and the hiring of a new? Do you have an average time frame? I would say today, 18 months to maybe even two years. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a long time, yeah. and that process is, is uh, you may get a lot of resumes, but again, learning as a church body, what do we really need, and who are we looking for, who's the best fit? Let's switch gears one more time here, David. I'm concerned about the leader themselves. What is the most single most overriding issue you think leaders face today, and why is that issue so prevalent? Well, I would say one of them is really kind of self-awareness, to really know who I am and be confident in that. Because I think what we need in today's environment is a self-differentiated leader, a leader that isn't going to be, in essence, caught in the trap of the chaos. People wanting to invite you into their problem, and so you go in, and the next thing you know, you're a pretzel. We need leaders who can be in the chaos, but not become part of it, but who can lead people through, who can, in essence, change their behavior in order to change the behavior of those around them instead of posturing to change to look like them. And that's a real temptation and it's really hard to do unless you, in essence, practice it. We, you, like you practice anything else, we need to practice being a leader. And that self-differentiated part is vitally important because it helps you stay focused in, in what your issues are and where you're going because there will be a lot of constituents that want you to go their way because there is so much change and you don't know their own stories and they're being, in essence, whipped up and they want to somehow bring it to bear and have you go their way. I just see a lot of, especially young leaders, uh, getting caught in that trap of how, how did I get here? This is, wasn't where I wanted to be. This isn't where I wanted to go. And uh, they listen to the winds of change as opposed to being the wind. So let's just say you do get aware of of what kind of leader they are. Sometimes it takes mentorship. Sometimes it takes uh, continuing education. And certainly some kind of resource barrel they can go back to, to where they can get some good information. Help our audience understand where this leader is brought to an awareness. You, You know, they're hired into the church. They're going in some pretty good direction. Where do they go for continuing education and other resources? I think you do do 
need to have a mentor. It would be someone who's not in the church, outside the church, someone that you look up to. I think more and more mentors or seasoned leaders are very willing to, because someone brought them up, they're very willing to share that information. Secondly, there's great books, but I warn people about books because books are written from the structure interpretation of the writer. This is how I lead, and the temptation then is, well, I got to do that. So it really foundationally starts with a sense of, Who am I? What are the abilities I have that I engage in when I'm faced with a situation? There's something all of us do over and over and over again because that's how it works for us. But we're usually not aware of it. So that's why having a mentor to help reflect, hold up the mirror, help us see our uh, what we're doing, I can't emphasize in that, that enough. Quite often we're looking for external cues as to how we're to lead when most of it's already inside of us. But we don't have people to help call that out. And that's what's needed, to call out who I am, let me see it, affirm it, value it, catch me when I'm doing the right thing and affirm that. That's what most leaders are lacking. So I'm going to stretch your thinking here a little bit, uh, David. Let's say you were giving a seminary class on this very topic. How would you structure it so it isn't just reading a book and writing a paper and and evaluating what so-and-so does? How would you help leaders actualize who they are as a leader, how they lead, and and how how do they grow it or mature it or get involved with it? Well, I might spend at least half of our time together helping them understand who they were because and that might take a while but if we don't get over that hurdle really nothing else matters and so I spend an awful lot of time whether I'm working with a couple that wants to get married or I'm working with the leader of an organization I spend an awful lot of time helping them understand who they are there's all kinds of assessments out there that get at that information and then I want to help them see because of who they are this is how they're going to enter into this situation or when conflict comes this is how they're going to do it so when they begin to understand that then we can begin to pose situations and then help them see this This is how you're going to respond to that and put them in situations and have them go into the context of where they are currently working or where they see themselves and begin to help them see, all right, when someone raises this problem, this this person brings this issue, or I've got a a boss above me that I might deem incompetent or is frustrating, how do I learn how to lead up? So we can begin, but it all starts from who you are. That's great. Well, David, we could go on into all different uh, scenarios and issues, and I think we've we've dealt enough with some of these. Let's just talk about McKnight Leadership Academy. For whoever's listening to us today, if it's church people or corporate people or, or if they have a small business or large, small or large church, who should really get a hold of you? I mean, if they're struggling with leadership or structure within the organization, systematic things, who should contact you? Give us a a little bit of an idea. A lot of what we do boils down to relationships. So most of the work I engage in, it's somebody in a relationship of some sort. And with relationships comes problems, comes concerns. How do we grow it? How do we build it? So it could be one person in terms of helping them understand what direction they need to go career-wise. Or it could be uh, two people or a group or even in mediation work. We try to... uh, enter into that kind of work where there's a problem we got to solve and uh, helping them understand who they are because it's really, there's a relationship they have and it's really relationship consulting. We talk about leadership because that's the word that stands out there, but underneath it all is relationships because transformation in anyone's life or a transformation in any organization comes through a relationship, I believe, in, rather than an event, than a one-time thing. Well, I've done that. Now it should get better. No, it's relationship. So... People that are involved in relationships or and, and want to grow their organization or a leader that is kind of stuck, this isn't working, we can generally kind of figure out what's going on and then determine how do we navigate our way forward. Most people today are looking in this world of change, how do I debrief myself so that I know how to navigate that which I don't know? How do I just live life with just the clues here because there are no maps anymore? 
You know, I was listening to the Governor Pawlenty here not long ago talk about how we have polarized as a society into silos. Mm. Everyone has their little silo of Republican or Democrat, conservative and liberal, and there's no longer that middle ground of coming into a, a neutral place where we discuss things. And therefore, leaders have to learn how to bring people out of those silos into that market area or that neutral area and begin to talk about ideas. There is common ground if we'll just be able to stop because we, uh, we're, we're human and we all want to be loved, valued. We all have a sense of significance. I talk to parents, your child wants to have a sense of strength. They, they want to be strong. They want to be significant and they want to have a sense of meaning and purpose. And if they don't find it at home, they'll go somewhere else. And so people are looking for that. People that work for you, people that live in your own home, we're all looking for that. So if we can look beyond labels and begin to understand that person really is looking for meaning and purpose, and we won't stop till we find it. We have to find it someplace. We're all, in essence, looking for salvation. We're looking for it in a lot of different ways. That's right. I love your uh, little saying on your card, at the intersection of leadership and life. And before we go into your specifics of how people can get a hold of you, David, I'd like one more story mm of success that uh, of someone you've worked with or an organization you've worked with that you've brought them to a point of an aha moment or to move them out of that stuck position. I had a uh, organization a, a number of years ago that was started out, there were three guys, they started the business and uh, we got a real clear picture of kind of the internal job description of all three men. Then began to build the job descriptions that they would actually do around what they were in essence made to do. So the president of the organization comes to me one day about six months later, and he says, you know, so-and-so here, one of his partners, he's not doing what I think he should be doing. And I said, well, what's he doing? Well, he's doing this, this, and this. I said, well, what's he designed to do? You know that. He said, well, he's designed to do these things. I said, well, what if you freed him up to do just that? Could you hire for the things that he doesn't do well? He thought a moment. He said, I guess we could do that. I said, well, why don't you give him the freedom to do the job to match him and see what happens? Well, in essence, they had to start a whole new company. He created so much business when he was freed up to do that which he was made to do. And so that organization, before they hired anybody, they figured out what were the abilities they had to have in that person to do that job. And they built a system around that so that the employees all know and that this job is built around me. So we wrap the job around the individual rather than the individual around the job. And that's what we try to do. Now there are about 30 people and uh, they're a growing business. Great story, David. Well, how do people get a hold of you? How do they access a website or an email address to get a hold of David McKnight? Well, our, our website is McKnightLeadershipAcademy.com. Our, my email is uh, david.mcknight at mcknightacademy.com. Phone number is... Uh, 612-990-6604. Thanks, David, for coming and sharing your, uh, your skill and your insights on leadership today.